Okay, good morning and welcome everyone to the 14th meeting of the Local Government Communities Committee in 2017. Can I remind everyone present to turn off mobile phones and as members' meet, uh, meeting papers are provided for members in a digital format, tablets may be used by members during the meeting. So that's my normal appeal. That's what we're doing if you see us on our phones and on our tablets. We're not doing anything else, I promise you. We're looking at our papers. Full house today. No apologies have been received. And we move to agenda item one, which is strategic housing investment plans. The committee will hear from the Minister from Local Government and Housing on strategic housing investment plans, or SHIPs, as they become commonly known. So can I welcome Kevin Shoot, Minister for Local Government and Housing. Good morning, Minister. Good morning. And can I also welcome Caroline Dix, Head of Affordable Housing, and Lisa Bullen, pl Planning Team Leader, Scottish Government. You're both very welcome. Good morning. Good morning. Minister, I think you've got an opening statement for us uh, this If morning. you don't mind, convener. Of course. Um, I welcome the opportunity to speak to the committee today uh, about local authority strategic housing investment plans, um, SHIPs as you've al already called them. Um, the purpose of the plans is to set out the Council's strategic investment priorities for affordable housing over a five-year period uh, in order to achieve the outcomes set out in their local housing strategy. Uh, we expect the document to set out investment priorities for affordable housing, to demonstrate how these will be delivered, uh, to identify the resources required to deliver these priorities and to ena enable the involvement of key partners. And I've actually brought uh, the ships with me that I received just prior to Christmas to give folk an indication um, of the documentation. Uh, some of them uh, are much more comprehensive uh, than others, uh, and we'll come back to that, I'm sure. Um, ships are part of the process uh, which supports the planning delivery of affordable houses across Scotland uh, and they are important in terms of engaging with stakeholders and housing providers to ensure that plans are deliverable. Uh, I therefore expect to see collaboration uh, between local authorities, uh, housing associations, communities, uh, developers, the Scottish Government and of course other stakeholders uh, in the SHIP development process. Um, it's very important to say that ships are plans uh, and not firm programmes, uh, but they will be the key documents for identifying strategic housing projects to assist the achievements of the 50,000 affordable homes target. Uh, and in setting out these plans, I therefore expect local authorities to over-programme to ensure delivery should any slippage occur. Uh, at the committee meeting on the 21st of December, I agreed to send the committee some analysis of the ships that were submitted in December 2016. The overall picture this gave us in terms of the 50,000 target was that we are making good progress, uh, but we need to do more to increase the potential cushion we should have uh, just in case some schemes fail uh, to come forward. Uh, the next ship is due for submission at the end of October 2017. Uh, please be in no doubt, convener, um, that this government is, uh, is ambitious for housing. Access to quality affordable housing is a vital part uh, of our drive to secure economic growth, uh, promote social justice, strengthen communities and tackle inequalities. We're determined to increase and accelerate housing supply and we will support local authorities uh, to deliver quality homes in mixed communities that fit local needs, delivering the right homes in the right places for the people of Scotland. Thank you, Convener. Thank you, thank you very much, Minister. That's very helpful. And I do remember the last time you were at our meeting, you, you pledged to use the, the, the Christmas holiday period to look over some of these uh, housing plans. I hope that was an enjoyable festive period for you. It was a uh, most Minister. enjoyable um, festive period for an anorak like myself. <laughs> Excellent. We've now got, I thought that for a time, Minister, we've now got that on the record. Excellent. Uh, can I um, ask, ask the bit of a constituency interest here, I suppose, Minister, because I was looking at the numbers you've provided, which is really, really helpful in terms of heading towards that 50,000 target, uh, and it really gives us something to, to follow throughout the years, and some committee members are going to be asking about that. But I was particularly interested in house types, so I, I, I was keen to know, because my, my biggest housing need that I get in my constituency, and all my colleagues are the same, are large family homes. So when I look at some of this data, 
uh, I see unit numbers and I see a breakdown between social rent, mid-market rent, low-cost home ownership, uh, partnership support for regeneration and a total of units. But what I don't get a flavour of is how many four-bedroom family homes does, is within that 50,000 mix or in the next financial year for a uh, new start. So where would that information sit? Um, convener, that's a matter for local authorities. The ships provide that strategic overview. Um, it's up to local authorities themselves to look at what housing need and demand is in their area um, and to align their future planning to take account of that. Um, beyond that, convener, I've made it quite clear as I've been uh, speaking to local authorities um, uh, housing associations and other partners um, that the subsidies um, that we provide are a baseline uh, and that if they want to talk to uh, my officials uh, about uh, delivering more larger uh, homes uh, four or five bedroom homes for example um, then they can talk to official officials about levels of flexibility um, the same applies um, to uh, wheelchair accessible homes where I'm extremely keen uh, to ensure that we are able uh, to deliver for all of the needs of the people. Um, and I'm pleased that um, certain uh, housing associations have been making great strides in providing um, that type of housing too. Um, so, you know, the ships themselves do not deal with the level of detail of housing types. Um, that comes out later uh, in terms of the delivery. Um, but you can be assured, convener, that I will continue to, to spread uh, the message that I have uh, about how uh, willing we are as a government to, to talk to um, local authorities and other providers about delivering such homes. Okay, that's helpful. Um it seems as if the, the numbers exist, but they exist across 32 local authorities if we were to go and look at the local housing strategies. And we hope that the local housing strategies articulate with the, the ships, but government doesn't do an analysis by house type of what the local housing strategy says for, for, for 32 local authorities. And we take local authorities on trust that they've got that right when it turns into these documents, which we're, we're calling as ships. So... Who monitors local authorities to make sure they're getting the the spread of house types accurate and correct for local needs and demands? Convener, uh, I, I think we always face the um, dilemma uh, in government where some folks say that uh, we're prone to overly centralising and uh, others say that we're not centralising and controlling enough. Um, I think, you know, we have to trust local authorities to ensure um, that they do the right thing in terms of analysing the need in their particular area. Um, and I know um, from my previous life as a, a councillor um, that, you know, I took um, a, a great interest in what we were delivering at that time, at a time where there was not very much building, it has to be said. And I'm sure the other ex-local authority members around the table did likewise. Um, beyond that, you know... Uh, we have in place regional um, teams on the ground um, across the country who are having regular discussions um, with local authorities, housing associations and other stakeholders um, about delivery um, from, their ship, from the ships, from looking at their local housing strategies uh, and all other aspects. Um, and those discussions with local authorities, uh, with my officials on the ground, continue. Uh, but it is in the interest of every local authority um, to make sure um, that what they are delivering um, is the right housing in the right places uh, for the people in their areas. OK. I suppose, Minister, there's a difference between uh, monitoring local authorities and dictating to local authorities. Those would be two separate things. And I absolutely agree with you that we shouldn't be dictating to local authorities. They know their communities best, and it's for them to do that, that, that get the strategy right in relation to that, but the Scottish Government may have a view how many large family homes we need across the country. I don't know if the Scottish Government does have a view on that. And if the Scottish Government does have a view on that, then you would want to make sure 
that when you add up those numbers across 32 local authorities, you're getting somewhere close towards that. So does the Scottish Government have a view on how many large family homes we need across the country? I think, you know, Convener, come back to the point that it's up to local authorities themselves uh, to uh, analyse this uh, and to ensure that their local housing strategies are absolutely right. What I would say to you is um, that I am doing everything possible uh, by saying that we will be flexible to make sure that local authorities can deliver um, the larger housing that they need in their areas. Um, it is important, I think, that we use the expertise uh, of the local authorities uh, who, who should know exactly what is required um, and for me to ensure that the barriers are taken down so that they can actually deliver um, those houses in their particular areas. OK, final question before I move to a supplementary. Um, can I just ask, if, if this committee, and I may be a lone voice in this committee, I have no idea, the Minister, will have to reflect on the evidence we get uh, after our, our session is complete, but if this committee decided there was interest in just trying to assure ourselves in relation to uh, the 32 local authorities and that they had a good balance in relation to the house types they were seeking to develop across Scotland and we saw a more systematic way of capturing that information, is that something you and your officials might be interested in discussing further with our committee? Um, Convener, as you uh, are very well aware and as members are very well aware, I'm always more than happy to cooperate with this committee. Um, and, you know, if we can provide you with further information, if uh, my officials can provide you with fur further information, um, feedback from our regional teams or whatever may that, that may be, uh, I'm more than happy to provide you with that information. That's really welcome. Thank you. Kenneth Gibson. Thank you very much, uh, Convener. Yeah, I, I want to kind of explore this a wee bit further. I mean, I noticed we've got two tables from SPICE. One is about unit information by tenure. And I notice uh, you know, it's divided with social rent, mid-market rent, low-cost home ownership, partnership support for regeneration. And if one looks at Glasgow, um, you know, their social rent's over 4,000 units. And the other three categories come to about three, just over 3,500 units. But if we look at North Ayrshire, for example, uh, all 1436 or social rent, and they're none of the other categories. And the similar situation is Ayrshire, where there's only 780 um, social rent, even though the population's similar to North Ayrshire, and again, none in each of these categories. If the Scottish what's the Scottish Government doing to try and encourage um, local authorities to ensure they have the ba that balance? Um, I would uh, encourage local authorities to do all that they can to ensure that need in their area um, is met. Um, Mr Gibson uh, mentions uh, North Ayrshire. Um, I always know that he has a keen interest in what is happening in his own constituency. Um, and I have to say that in terms of uh, North Ayrshire, Mr Gibson uh, will know that um, I'm uh, quite pleased that some of the development has taken place there, particularly um, Cunningham Housing Association, who um, are a real get-up-and-go housing association, um, providing um, homes that are required right across the Ayrshires and are about to move into Dumfries and Galloway. Um, but, you know, I would encourage every local authority and other stakeholders um, to take um, cognizance of the need in those particular areas. In terms of the specifics um, that Mr Gibson has asked for uh, about mid-market rent uh, and low-cost home ownership, I would have to get back to him with more detail um, around about the situation in North Ayrshire and East Ayrshire, um, convener, because I don't have that to hand. That's just one for our point, uh, convener. Uh, similarly, and it's on the issue of uh, units by type. And first of all, I'd like to thank the Minister for handing out the awards to Cunningham Housing Association at the reception hosted a week ago yesterday. But uh, in terms of these, uh, these um, you know, uh, units by type, I've also noted the extraordinary differences in terms of general needs and specialist provision varying by local authorities. So, for example, Argyle and Butte uh, has 1,115 general needs houses planned, but only one specialist provision which seems to me remarkably odd. And again, I go back to North Ayrshire, my own area, where it's 865 general needs, but 571 special provision. Murray, 459 special provision compared to 723 general needs. So in one local authority, general needs outnumber special provision by more than 1,000 to 1, whereas in the two other two local authorities I've mentioned, it's 3 to 2. Edinburgh, for example, it's 15 to 1 uh, general needs, and these Ayrshire figures don't seem to add up 
at all. It's maybe some kind of typing error. But there does seem to be a radical differences between the provision of general needs and specialist provision housing. And I thought that would certainly, uh, if not alarm the Scottish Government, certainly uh, draw comment from you on that. Um, I think uh, I'm going to look to my left, uh, <laughs> Ms Dix, but... In terms of the last eight turn figures, um, the housing for general needs, 94% of them um, were houses um, which uh, are suitable for varying needs. So, you know, the homes for life concept, basically, we're mm -hmm. talking about. So, although we're talking about general needs, um, you know, we are getting much better um, at ensuring that these homes um, can be uh, adaptable. Um, beyond that, um, I think it would be fair to say that um, I've been looking carefully uh, in terms of specialist provision and making sure um, that specialist provision um, is countered for. And we have, of course, um, in recent times, uh, published uh, as a government the Fairer Scotland for Disabled uh, people plan, um, which I'm just trying to find at this moment, uh, Mr. Gibson, um, where you know we set out uh, quite clearly what our ambition is, um, and that's working together with disabled people's organisations and the housing sector uh, on how we improve choice and availability of accessible housing, uh, ensuring that the housing-focused actions within that delivery plan. Uh, will help support uh, more accessible homes throughout the country. Um, and we um, will continue to work with local authorities, uh, disabled people and other stakeholders to make sure um, that realistic <coughs> targets are set um, within local housing strategies uh, for the delivery of wheelchair accessible housing. Um, some 13% um, of the uh, housing that's outlined in ships um, are um, uh, uh, housing uh, in, of, in this regard. Beyond that, um, convener, um, of late uh, in my travels, uh, of which there have been plenty again recently, um, I have visited uh, new developments which have a fair number of wheelchair accessible houses. Uh, including a visit to Arden in Glasgow, uh, a Glen Oaks development there the other week, where within that development, which I can't remember if it was 42 or 48 houses there, four of those houses um, were wheelchair accessible. Uh, one of those houses had been allocated to uh, a family um, with a six-year-old daughter who was wheelchair bound. Um, they were um, particularly happy with the home. Uh, the young lass is a great baker and the uh, fact that the uh, kitchen units and oven could be lowered is just fantastic for them and that's the kind of thing that we need to provide for, for families like that. Um, Glen Oaks themselves, um, when coming up with that development, had nobody on their waiting lists who required a wheelchair accessible home. Uh, but went ahead with this development with those wheelchair accessible houses, recognising that there was need in Glasgow. Um, and of course went to other providers who, um, who uh, quite quickly um, uh, helped them fill those properties. Now I want not only the Glen Oaks of the, this world or the Rural Stirling Housing Association or Parkhead, which I recently visited as well, to take account of this. I want all um, uh, housing associations and local authorities to look at this provision, making sure um, that the local housing strategy and the need that is shown um, is fulfilled. Um, I've said all along, convener, um, that this is a housing programme uh, for all of Scotland and it's a housing programme for all of the people of Scotland and I want to make sure that we get this absolutely right. Yes. Yeah. Well, Mr. Gibson, so I, I, thanks very much for that, Minister. But I, I do I understand what you're saying. If you look at the national figures, they seem reasonable for specialist provision. But you know, it does seem you've a 571 times more likely to get offered a specialist provision house in North Ayrshire than in Argyll and Butte. 
and and so that there seems to me to be a real a real issue about um, about provision locally in that, and I hope that's something the Scottish government will certainly take back to local authorities uh, 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 to press for a, an increase in areas where there aren't. But if we look at rehab housing, again we see a huge disparity: zero for Dundee, zero for Falkirk, zero for Inverclyde. But there's 102, for example, again in North Ayrshire, 101 in North Lanarkshire, 648 in Glasgow. More than half, in fact, of all rehab houses in Scotland and in Glasgow. Again, there seems to be a huge disparity in the provision of, uh, of, of, of such services. I mean, Edinburgh has only got 11 rehab houses, for example, um, you know, um, 520 in, uh, in uh, Jenny's area. So I, w I wonder again what discussions the Scottish Government is having about this uh, particular issue and ensuring that the, the appropriate uh, housing is, is made available for people who require that. I, I, I don't want to repeat myself, but I, I mm -hmm. want to ensure that the appropriate housing mm -hmm. is available for folk right across the country. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the detail that um, Mr Gibson has asked for there, um, we will provide more detail to the committee. Uh, beyond that, um, I'd like to assure the committee again um, that the regional teams across the country continue to have these discussions about what the needs of particular areas are. Um, I don't have the the level of detail that um, Mr Gibson requires for individual local authorities here, but we will certainly get back to the committee uh, with uh, further answers on that uh, and give you an indication um, of what um, the folk on the ground uh, are actually discussing with local authorities in that regard. Thank you. Thanks, yeah. Camille. That's really helpful, Mr Gibson. That's that theme again about trying to assure ourselves there's a consistency of, a consistency of approach across 32 local authorities, including in the house types as well as specialist housing. Mr Simpson. Thanks, Convener. Um, thanks for coming, Minister. Um, I just want to um, look a bit at the uh, 50,000 affordable homes target. Um, I wonder if, just for the record, if you could tell us how many units are planned for in, in the ships, because uh, uh, there seems to be, well, there is a shortfall um, if you can p compare that with uh, 50,000. So given that that's the case, um, how confident are you and how do you plan to fill that gap? Um, within the, um, the ships themselves, the recent analysis shows um, that affordable housing completions for the 50,000 period, that's 2016 to 2021, they're estimated to be 44,891. Um, that does not include um, completions uh, from 1718 from the National Programme. Uh, the National Programme including things like Homeowner Support Fund, Open Market Shared Equity Scheme and the National Housing Trust and LAR. That um, will, for example, OMSI uh, continues to, if it continues to contribute at the current rate, that's 1,700 completions per annum. So that could contribute a further 6,800 units over the period 2017 to 21. Um, a further 8,859 completions um, are identified in 2021-22. Uh, and some of these may be ca capable of being accelerated into uh, the 50,000 period. Um, I am keen, uh, as I think we all are, uh, to make sure that we have a cushion. Um, as I said uh, in my opening remarks, uh, we know that often there is sl slippage. I want to make sure that there is over-programming uh, and a cushion so that we meet that target. So um, I hope that's clear enough for, yeah, for Mr. Simpson. That, that, that's clear. I just um, wonder how realistic you think the, the ships are, because you, you said in your opening remarks that uh, some are more comprehensive than others, um, which would tend to indicate that you're not very happy with some of them. Um, so I wonder if you can give us more, more detail on that. You also said that they're, they're plans and not firm programmes. Um, so, given given that that's the case, um, you know, I just wonder how confident you are that these figures are, are accurate. Sure. Uh, in terms, convener, of uh, the individual ships put forward by um, local authorities, uh, some of the detail put forward by some of the local authorities was vast. 
uh, where they are identifying um, sites and housing types and the entire gamut. Um, other local authorities um, in December submitted numbers only um, in terms of the amount of houses um, that they expected uh, to bring forward. Um, we have expanded on that um, and the detail has been teased out um, in most places because of teams in the ground talking to, to local authorities. So as we move on, um, you know, uh, confidence uh, grows. Uh, however, I am in some regards an optimist, um, but in other regards a pessimist. Uh, and I want to make absolutely sure um, that we deliver um, our ambitious target during the course of this parliamentary term. Um, discussions will continue to be had uh, to try and get um, firmed up proposals. Um, and there have been um, some changes during the course um, of that period, December to now. Um, things, um, you know, which uh, have occurred, which uh, have filled me with some joy. Um, I was uh, uh, particularly um, worried about delivery in certain parts of Scotland. Um, it seems that, um, that some folk have stepped up to the plate and that delivery um, looks much more likely now than it previously did. Um, I, would, I wouldn't go as far as to say um, that I'm filled with the ultimate amount of optimism in that regard, but um, I would say that my glass is three quarters full. Um, and, you know, we have a, a situation where um, the programme itself um, is leading uh, to a situation where um, some housing associations, for example, um, are moving into areas where they have never um, carried out any business before. Um, we, we talked about Cunningham Housing Association earlier, um, which is mainly delivered in, um, in the Ayrshire's. Um, but they are now moving to Dumfries and Galloway, and that will be a great boon to the southwest of Scotland in terms of what they will be able to deliver there, uh, and that will help them um, in terms of uh, the, meeting their social housing requirements in the southwest. Um, but the one thing that I can assure the committee um, is that I will continue um, to. Um, to talk to my officials all of the time to make sure that we continue to bolster um, that number and provide an even greater cushion so that we reach that target of 50,000 and in particular the target of 35,000 um, uh, social houses for social rent. Um, and I will continue, um, of course, to update the committee uh, as and when you require me to. Anything else, Mr Simpson? Um, is it okay? One more. It is long. Yes. Of it does. It does relate. It's just a, the you know the minister. Um, yeah, I, I accept you say you, your, your glass is three quarters full, but what about the other quarter? Are there any areas of the country that we as a committee might want to be looking at? Um, I I think you know the southwest was a, an area where I had a particular concern. Um, that's an area. Um, where I have uh, less of a concern now. Um, you know, I will continue to, to look at um, all parts of the country to, to make sure that everybody is benefiting from this, as I've said uh, numerous times um, to the committee. Um, and, you know, I've been all over the place talking to folk because I think the best way of, of dealing with this is actually to get the on-the-ground knowledge um, from people about what is practical, what is not. Um, and, you know, I have to say that the conversations that I've been having are pretty positive. But, you know, my eyes and ears on the ground, uh, Miss Dix and Miss Bullen's uh, colleagues and regional offices um, are the folk that I rely on um, to, to be able to say to me, well, this is going uh, well, you may want to keep an eye on this. Um, and, you know, they are the ones who communicate constantly about what um, is happening. Or not, as the case may be, but in yeah. the main, it's what is happening. Right. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jenny Gorith.
Uh, thank you, convener, and good morning to the panel. Um, the government advice in terms of ships advocates a co-production approach, um, the idea being to obviously involve people as early as possible in that process. I just wonder if the Minister could perhaps give some examples of where stakeholders mm. have engaged with local authorities as part of that process, um, perhaps with an eye to sharing good practice at national level where it's been done well. Um, let me relate a, a conversation that I had uh, only yesterday um, with CCG um, who um, are providing um, uh, houses, manufacturing houses off site. Um, and they were talking about um, the cooperation that they were having with East Ayrshire Council. Uh, and I think the level of cooperation um, there is quite high. Um, uh, again, um, if we stick to East Ayrshire, um, their relationship with the main housing association in the area, which again is Cunningham, um, is again very, very good. Um, as you go to, to various places, um, uh, you know, people are talking about good levels of cooperation. If, if we go back a few months um, in Strathblane, um, rural Stirlingshire Housing Association were talking about the, the good cooperation that they'd had with um, Stirling Council, um, Scottish Government and other partners uh, to deliver the first social housing um, in that village for 40, 50 years. Um, uh, so I think that the level of cooperation um, is, is pretty high out there. People also know um, that if they face any difficulties or any barriers um, in what they're trying to achieve, uh, my door is open. Um, folk are not backward in, in, in coming forward and in, in having um, discussions about various barriers. Um, but those barriers don't seem to be between local authorities and housing associations, for example. When I first took on the role, one of the the, the barriers that there there was was um, between um, some of the, the the developers and Scottish Water. Uh, Scottish Water have taken action um, to um, change their workforce to make sure um, that they're more delivery focused and they they've improved a, a fair bit. I always say though that if anybody feels that there is any particular problem, um, I'd be grateful if they passed it on to me. Um, because I kind of deal with these things unless I know about them. Thank you. Um, in terms of the review process for ships, what kind of feedback have you had uh, from local authorities and what kind of feedback do you give to local authorities as part of that review process? Well, again, um, I'm reliant on the regional teams um, to go and speak to local authorities, um, to hear their views uh, and how they think the process has gone, and also to feed back the views um, uh, from, from uh, government. Um, I have to say that we have got um, an extremely uh, good set of people uh, on the ground um, who uh, are, are in constant communication. Um, with um, uh, authorities uh, and other partners. They are the eyes and ears that I rely on. Um, uh, I may convene her and at this point bring in uh, Ms Dix to, to talk a little bit more about what um, these officials are actually doing at this moment. Um, the review of the um, ships that come in is a process that was agreed with COSLA in terms of our communications with local authorities. So there's a number of areas that officials look at in our area teams when they're submitted. So the kind of things that they consider are things that the Minister's already mentioned, so that the projects that they've listed as priorities align with the strategy that they've set out for their area. Um, so that's looked at. Um, we also look at the feasibility of delivery in terms of some of the timescales that are being set out for the, the projects. And the minister talked about you know, some projects not happening and it, making sure there's enough capacity in the programme should that happen for other things to come forward. Um, we look at the resources that they're setting out. Obviously, that's part of what they set out in the ship, uh, the money that's needed to take um, 
the projects forward and also again that's been covered by the committee things like um, how stakeholders have been consulted so when we're reviewing the ships those are the kind of areas that we look at and then we write back to each local authority based on the ship and um, just covering any points based on that if I can maybe add to that because these are um, all of all of the positives um, during the course of um, some discussions earlier on in the year um, some of the community housing associations in certain parts of the country one part in particular um, were not quite happy um, about the lack of input that they felt that they had into um, the ship in that particular area. Um, and that's the kind of thing that we will feed back to the, the local authority as well. Um, Convener, as I've um, said before in, uh, in answer to questions here at the committee and in, in, in answers to um, uh, Mr Simpson, I'm very keen that um, community housing associations, community-led housing associations are involved in every part of this process too. So, you know, the feedback that we get back, we will relate to them um, uh, and uh, urge them to, to, to do things a little bit differently when it comes to the next ship in October. Scrooge, do you want to follow up with any of that? Thank you. Uh, Andy Whiteman. Uh, thank you, uh, Convener. Um, Following up um, some questions that Kenneth Gibson asked um, earlier about specialist provision, um, you have suggested that 13% of planned developments um, within the ships are for specialist um, provision. Can you say something about how that figure was arrived at and whether you think that's an you know, appropriate figure given with an ageing population and an increased focus on the need to develop independent living? Well, again, I would say to... Um, uh, Mr. Whiteman, convener, that local authorities have got to assess their own needs in their in their area, um, and I think they have got to, of course, take account of changing uh, demographics when they are uh, making their planning assumptions. Um, I think you know the 13% figure. Um, I, I will uh, get uh, officials to to to, to talk how they've come to that number. Um, but I think the key thing for me is not just the 13% specialist, it is ensuring um, that the stock um, that we are delivering um, uh, are uh, capable of adaptation. And I think, you know, the fact that we have reached that figure in the last outturn of 94% of the housing that's being delivered uh, being uh, uh, for varying need is an important um, uh, one to have reached. Obviously, um, there's room for still further improvement, but not much. Um, uh, and we'll continue to make sure um, that we create that situation uh, of homes for life. But in terms of the 13% figure, uh, I'll ask Ms Dix to come in. As, as we mentioned earlier, the... The projects are based, based very much on what the local authority assesses as the local needs. Um, and I think, as, as Mr uh, Gibson mentioned, that varies across different local authorities. So some local authorities might place a much higher priority on providing those types of projects, um, others less so. Um, so we could kind of collate those figures up nationally and at the moment based on the current ships that's what it shows as the minister said these are live documents and these are going to be updated again in october this year so that figure may, might change it might increase um one of the things we would look at would be if for example an individual local authority in its strategy was saying that housing for specialist provision was a particular priority then we would look to follow that through to see in the ship that that actually showed those types of projects being in their plans uh, for funding going forward. So that's the kind of thing that we do when we're looking uh, to assess the ships when they come in. Um, so it, the 13% the is just a figure of what the local authorities are saying to us at the moment. Um, they want to provide over the next few years in the affordable programme. Again, convener, if I can just add a little bit to that, because um, as I am out and about, you know, I'm making it uh, quite well known um, but in terms of the flexibilities um, that are there in terms of sub subsidy, that we will look very, very um, uh, carefully um, at bids um, for higher subsidy level to provide um, the likes of wheelchair accessible housing. I think that message um, is getting through, um, and I would reiterate the point that many of uh, the housing providers 
um, housing associations in particular um, that I've uh, been to visit of late um, are taking cognizance of what is required um, and are actually delivering uh, wheelchair accessible housing on the ground at this moment. Uh, thank you. I suppose what was behind my question is the fact that we've had evidence in the budget review um, session, for example, from uh, independent living in Scotland who argue that in some areas the provision is fine, in other areas it's not fine. So to what extent is the Scottish Government um, not just monitoring the, the match between the local housing strategy and, and the ship, but actually that in fact local authorities in certain parts of Scotland are indeed making enough provision for uh, people with specialist needs sure. and, and, and can potentially step in to encourage more if, where, if and where that's needed? I, I would encourage um, a, any disability group um, to speak to local authorities uh, and get involved in the formulation. We talked about the disability um, action plan um, and, you know, uh, it, I, I think it's absolutely vital um, that local authorities um, listen to groups within their area where um, folks do not feel that there's the provision. Um, I, I have to say that in, in some cases, and I'm, I'm going to be very careful in what I say here because I don't want to identify individuals, um, but, you know, I'm aware of situations where a wheelchair accessible house has been built in a particular area um, to meet the needs of someone in that area who would have had to have moved away um, if that had not happened. Now, I think that, you know, local authorities, housing associations, other partners uh, should be looking very closely uh, at that kind of need so that we don't have those kind of, of circumstances. Um, also, you know, I, I've said that um, people should talk to, to local authorities. I am also um, willing to, to listen to, to folk about their experiences in particular areas. Um, and again, I would go and encourage the, the local authorities and other providers um, in areas where there is felt to be a, 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 a not enough uh, housing to meet the demand to actually take advantage of the flexibilities um, within um, the subsidies. And convener, um, as always, if if colleagues come across any particular difficulties in their own patches, um, I'm willing to, to, to hear about that and, and do what I can to encourage um, a, a greater provision if that is required in particular areas. Thank you. Okay, Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Convener. Thank you, Minister. We, we've touched today on about the, the mix and the, the size of developments, uh, and it would be quite useful to find out about how we, the decisions uh, are taken about what projects are finally approved and how they, how they become approved uh, and, and how transparent that whole process is and how confident you are about these projects and the needs and the budgets within these projects, how they're identified uh, for housing and, and the strategies that are put forward? Uh, well, again, we're reliant on local authorities to scrutinise uh, exactly what is required in their area, where it's required and what is required. Um, and Mr Stewart will uh, know, having just recently re retired from a council, um, that that level of scrutiny um, uh, can be quite high um, in, in local authorities. Um, beyond that, in terms of um, scrutiny um, from uh, government side, um, in terms of making sure that the uh, resources that we are providing um, are being utilised in the best possible ways. Uh, again, you know, we're reliant on our folk on the ground. Um, and, you know, as I'm out and about, um, you know, I come across these folk on a, a regular basis. Um, and it would be fair to say that their knowledge of the projects um, is uh, fairly high, uh, very high, uh, in fact. Um, so, again, uh, a combination of project, the right project management and scrutiny um, at local authority level, but beyond that, you know, that oversight that our folk on the ground are taking to make sure that the resources that we are, are spending are being spent right on the right things, on the right places um, for folks throughout the country. And, and how do you, how, how do we 
<coughs> look at the overall budgets that are, that are met and managed centrally uh, with those that are managed locally. Well, in, in terms of um, the um, budgets that are held centrally, um, there's probably no greater scrutineer in some regards than me in making sure that every penny goes as far as it possibly can. In terms of the uh, monies um, that are given directly um, to councils um, through the affordable housing um, programme, uh, you know, I again have made it very clear to, to local authorities, if they are unable um, to spend the resource that they are being given, um, then I will have no qualms about moving money elsewhere um, to authorities that are able to use that resource. Um, again, that's uh, a, 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 another uh, insurance, if you like, um, that we deliver um, uh, the 50,000 target. Uh, that is something that I don't want to do. Um, I would rather that uh, authorities spent their full allocations. Um, but, you know, if, if that does not happen, then I will not be afraid to, to move resource to other places who are going to be able to, to spend it and deliver. Thank you, Convener. Hey, hey, do you want to uh, yes, Elaine Smith. Thanks very much, Convener. Uh, just briefly on that line of questioning, Minister, and thanks for joining us this morning. Um, could the resource then be used for, I suppose back to something Kenneth Gibson was exploring earlier about rehabil rehabilitation, if that's the right word, or off-the-shelf type purchase, but could the resource be used to buy back housing into the public sector? Again, that's a matter for local authorities if, if they uh, want to do so. Um, what I would say is where it can be demonstrated um, that the use of grant to acquire housing for rent off the shelf uh, is, is the most uh, appropriate method of meeting uh, the housing needs identified within a particular council area um, and is consistent with um, the priorities that are in the, the ship and, um, uh, and uh, the uh, in other plans, um, grant subsidy can be made through the uh, Affordable Housing Supply Programme uh, to do that. Um, we're aware that a number of um, local authorities uh, have purchased uh, ex-local authority properties um, with the support of the EHSP grant. Um, and... Uh, I have, I have no difficulty with that as long as, you know, it meets the needs within that particular area. Thanks. Re re really helpful, Minister. I mean, I'm not going to outline very briefly and without identifying the, the family, a, a constituency case of mine. It's the third time I've actually raised the case. I think it shows the policy challenges we have and what you said was very interesting. So... Um, an elderly person has previously bought their council house. It's maybe a second floor flat. It's a one bedroom. It's in perfectly good condition. Failing health starts. They're, they're kind of in poverty. There's not much of an asset there. That house isn't any good for them. They could feel a little bit trapped in it. And I'm delighted the Housing Association is considering buying that house back or that flat back in Glasgow. But the person really needs alternative accommodation. So is there anything to stop... Um, housing grants, so Glasgow would be the HAG grant or whatever, the housing grants in Glasgow funding that purchase for the housing association and identifying a suitable accommodation for that that individual because that then frees up a social rented tenancy elsewhere. So I'm just trying to identify where that grant would sit and whilst it might not actually show up on the 50,000 target, that's a new social rented house brought back into the sector. Of course, should show up on the fifty thousand target. So it's just to make sure that each of the budgets talk to each other. If that makes sense, we're joining the dots over this to make sure because this particularly vulnerable constituent's life would be transformed and a lot of stress would go away, and a new house would come back into social rent. Also, it's difficult for me to talk about an individual case convener, as you well know. However, what I would say. Um, uh, is that I would expect common sense to apply. Um, 
if that house were to be um, purchased back into local authority um, or housing association control, um, that would be one added um, to the target um, because it is a, a new home that has previously not been available um, and is now uh, available. Um, say it's difficult for me to to judge um, a, a particular case without knowing the full detail of the property and the circumstances and various other things. But what I would look um, at in that regard um, uh, is for common sense to apply um, and for the local authority, the housing association, uh, to work in partnership to try and find uh, the best possible outcome for, for folks. But that's very helpful, Minister, because up until now I didn't realise the Housing Association could make the case to the local authority to get grant funding to buy that back. I thought the Housing Association may have to use their own resources to do that. So that's really interesting. It helps me out <laughs> in, my, in my local area. Um, I, I'm just clarifying some of this. This can be done in a, a mixture of ways. Sure. Um, if you want to, Convener, um, if you write to me, um, I will respond back um, with what we think is possible. But obviously, um, at the end of the day, it's a matter for the local authority and the housing association that we can provide you with the details uh, of, of how that could um, happen. I'll certainly do that, Minister. I think we've got progress for the constituent. It was the kind of wide, wider policy position. I was fascinated and very, very helpful. I also took the opportunity to read through uh, the Glasgow housing strategy from 2017 to 2022, whilst my colleagues were, were asked, well, 100 pages, I read through some of it, Minister, OK? But what I did garner from that was that uh, 15,000 uh, new builds are the, is the target in Glasgow with... 70% uh, of them to be social rent, and that sounds really quite impressive, actually. I may have missed it. I couldn't see in that what the house types were, but I'll go back and I'll check that one anyway, Minister. But what I did see was that the overcrowding levels in the city of Glasgow were 17.4%. The national average is 9%. So that's an indicator for myself, and it may work out the strategy. I've had a brief look at it this morning, may take that into account when it goes for its new build programme. But what I, as another example, I think, Minister, of we would have to, there are certain <coughs> indicators I'd be hoping each local authority would use consistently and the government would monitor nationally in relation to aspects such as overcrowding. And there's an example in Glasgow where they're way above the national average, which would suggest larger new build homes would be pretty important. And of course, for every larger new build home you get, you move an overcrowded family into a new build home and you free up another tenancy, so you actually get a double hit in relation to that. So overcrowding, does that feature in your analysis of ships, Minister? Uh, what you have read, uh, Convener, is Glasgow's um, local housing strategy. Um, I would expect um, Glasgow's local housing strategy um, to play a major part uh, in the formulation um, of uh, the delivery on the ground. Um, what I would say um, is, again, you know, these are matters for local authorities. Um, I have made my um, situation uh, very, very clear um, in the fact that we are more than willing to have discussion about flexibility and grant subsidy if folk want to build um, uh, houses with more bedrooms to resolve some of the overcrowding um, problems that you have mentioned there. Um, again, if I refer back to, to my last visit to Glasgow, which was a couple of weeks ago, to Arden, um, the houses that were being built there um, were um, larger family houses. Um, in some cases, um, townhouses built on three floors. Um, which uh, uh, meets the needs of that particular area and was providing uh, much needed regeneration in a, a poorer part of the city. It would be wise for the local authority um, in cooperation with its housing association partners, uh, including those in the community housing association sector, um, to take complete cognizance of what the local housing strategy that you've read says uh, and make sure um, that the on-the-ground delivery um, reflects exactly what is required in the city of Glasgow. Okay, I think that's very helpful, certainly for our committee 
to get our head around how each of these strategic documents feed into meeting that 50,000 target, but also meeting the housing need on the ground. I think that's what we're wrestling with as a committee. So that answer's helpful. Would any of my colleagues want to come in for any further, further questions? Uh, Minister, before we, we wind up uh, today's session, an opportunity, if you put anything else uh, on the record in, in relation to this matter that you don't feel you've the chance to say this morning, there's time for that. Um, convener, I, I would just like to thank the committee once again um, for allowing me to come here today. Um, I'm quite sure that over the course of the next uh, few years, uh, you will continue to, to scrutinise um, the housing programme. Um, the committee should know that I'm very much focus and, focused on delivery um, to ensure that we uh, reach that 50,000 affordable homes target. 35,000 of those for social rent. And of course, um, the government's commitment is backed up uh, by that £3 billion pounds worth of investment over the course of the Parliament. Um, the only other thing that I would like to put on record, um, really, convener, is my thanks um, to partners across the country, whether that be local authorities, housing associations, um, developers and other stakeholders, um, including communities themselves who have not been backward and coming forward uh, and telling me what they would like to see. Um, without them, um, we would not be able to do this. So uh, I'd like to thank them very much and thank you for allowing me the opportunity to give evidence today. Thank you much, Minister, and thank you to your your team for coming along as well. That's a nice way to end this particular session. So that, that concludes this item on the agenda. Can we suspend briefly? Thank you.
Pauline. Thank you very much. Can I reopen this uh, session? This session of the committee and we turn to agenda item two which is post legislative scrutiny of the high hedges scotland act 2013 and the committee will now take evidence from local authorities on its post legislative scrutiny and i would like to welcome the panel we have with us kevin wright environmental planner aberdeen city council alistair hamilton services manager from fife council and Paul Kettles, Planning Enforcement Officer North from Perth and Kinross Council. Could I now invite each member of the panel to make short opening remarks, and we'll just start with Kevin Wright, please. Thank you. Um, I think as an opener, I'd like to say that uh, we found the legislation overall of much benefit within the city. Um, we haven't had the greatest number of formal applications, but what we have seen is a huge number of inquiries um, that the end result has been resolution due to the legislation being in place and not actually requiring a, um, an application to ourselves. So certainly I would say from that perspective, been incredibly beneficial. Um, I think probably my main concern about the review of the high hedges is, in our experience in Aberdeen, what we've experienced is numerous applications for what is commonly be becoming to be regarded as non-hedges. Uh, in our experience, more trees than hedges. Um, I would take the opportunity to flag that I would have concerns about this potential review expanding sort of the, the remit of the High Hedges Act. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Can I invite Alistair Hamilton to make an opening remark, please? Thank you, convener. Um, in terms of Fife's experience, um, I suppose it, it's part similar to, to my colleagues here. Um, there was an initial um, probably flurry of applications at the start of the introduction of the legislation where I think it was representative of perhaps historic cases or issues that had been um, in existence for a while and the legislation was seen as the mechanism to advance those cases and in pursuing those that that led to an initial uh, larger number of applications and I suppose for some of those people it probably um, heightened their expectation of what could be addressed and then that was then um, distilled, I suppose, uh, through what actually could be applied in terms of the legislation and the definition in relation to what a hedge is or, or isn't, and probably what we'll come on to maybe a bit later about where that sits in relation to trees and legal definitions and things. Um, as I said in my submission, in Fife we had 23 formal applications um, over the course of the period that the legislation's been in place, and that probably might seem relatively low and as i say of those eight have gone through if you like the whole process to some form of resolution or rejection and i think what i what i have said in my submission is that while that demand or number may not seem large for those people who have actually achieved a resolution of that of their issue that has undoubtedly been important and a success for them. Much, Paul Kettles. Hi, good morning. Good morning. Um, yeah, I think I could um, reiterate, I suppose, the comments my colleagues have made from, uh, we've experienced this similar sort of scenarios um, in 2014 when uh, the Act uh, came into um, vogue. The um, Perth and Canals Council received a flurry of applications and um, as in total to date we've received 21 um, and of those 21 um, seven so a third we've deemed as not a hedge the remaining uh, 14 um, were subject to uh, high hedge notices being served and of those many of them uh, seven were subject to appeals process with the Scottish Government, the DPA, and uh, but ultimately most of those were varied of those that were appealed. So as a consequence of the Act coming in, we've had 12 hedges, in effect, out of the 21 applications, subject to being cut. 
and we've had people saying how grateful they were that the legislation has come. So that they were, as I say, some of these um, applicants had been waiting for several years. I had correspondence, you know, dating back 15 years between lawyers over um, some of the, the situations they'd experienced. So they were very grateful for uh, the council taking action under the legislation. So um, I think uh, we have had, obviously, the issue of people uh, submitting applica applications for um, things that we would not consider to be hedges. So, you know, woodlands, for example, um, which has, uh, you know, given rise to a bit of concern from a lot of people. But at the end of the day, it is not a High Trees Act, it's a High Hedges Act. And um, I know there's been a lot of discussion about the definition, the legal definition, and I trust that we'll perhaps may uh, get some clarity out of this process. Thank you very much. We did have a previous evidence session. I'm sure colleagues on the committee will want to pick up many of the points, but given what Mr Kessels has just said, I think that moves us quite nicely on to what uh, Andy Whiteman wishes to explore with the panel. So if I could ask Andy Whiteman. Uh, thank you, convener, and thanks for coming in um, today. I must say, when I first looked at this Act, um, which says it's an Act of the Scottish Parliament to make provision about hedges, which interfere with the reasonable enjoyment of residential properties, I was surprised not to find a definition of a hedge. And some of the confusion appears, or some of the concern that we've heard from um, the occupiers of properties who wish to use this legislation appears to hinge on the question of when is a hedge not a hedge. Um, and the definition that is given in the Act is a definition of a high hedge that demands that it be a hedge in the first place. And I think Aberdeen, um, your evidence has articulated this well in stage in, 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 the, in, the, in the opening paragraphs of your uh, evidence to us. I wonder if you could um, um, give us your thoughts on the extent to which this is a central problem with the legislation and or with people's understanding of what the legislation is, in, is, is designed to do. Um, I think it's probably a, a bit of a two-part issue. Um, there, we we appear to be quite clear in what we consider to be a hedge as opposed to trees. Um, I think the big problem here lies in as much as um, people put a lot of hope in this legislation to resolve issues. Um, and telling somebody um, that they cannot use this piece of legislation because, you know, we deem that their trees, the vegetation that is at the, at the sort of heart of the issue, isn't construed to be a hedge. Um, as I say, we, you'll see in my submission, we have a sort of a, a number of tests that we utilise um, to try and distill that down. Um, I think to put it into sort of some context as to how big an issue this is with the legislation, um, we have probably only just about resolved two cases now that have been going on for probably the best part of two years of <coughs> massive amount of correspondence backwards and forwards. The initial stage, probably over the span of a year with these two correspondents, were trying to explain our position. Um, we were always saying no, uh, but we were getting dozens of questions back which we were happy to answer. Um, it got to the stage that we were spending so much time on it that we then had to direct those applicants to our complaints procedures because really we couldn't get people to understand or in, maybe not understand but to take on board um, because it's such an emotive issue for people. Um, there's that sort of refusal um, whereas I think if you're not involved in the situation, you can quite easily say, you know, whether it's a hedge or whether it's not. Um, and I think that's probably the biggest failure of the Act at the moment, is that there isn't clear clarification on that. I can I ask other panel members to comment first? Here others would be useful. Would any of the other members wish to comment? Yeah. Mr Hamilton? Thank, thank you, Chair. Uh, convener. Um, I think what we've tried to do in fight, I mean, it's a similar experience. Um, our um, customer guidance has included sort of pictures and general information as to, to try and, I suppose, as much as anything, manage expectations about what the legislation can deliver and um, 
what it can achieve for people in terms of what is and isn't a hedge under the terms of the definitions. Um, I, I think I would agree with, with Kevin in so much as the, the, the fact that there perhaps isn't another route to take a definitive or, def or, or achieve a definitive legal um, conclusion as to what is and isn't a hedge, where it's left to some degree perhaps a subjective judgment just with the local authority and then the, um, the public or the complainer feels that they have to continually enter into that discussion with the local authority to gain clarity or um, satisfaction that it's justified in terms of the decision the local authority has taken. Thank you. Mr Kettles? Yeah, I, I do think that the the way that um, the Act has been narrated in terms of uh, the inclusion of two or more trees or shrubs has led to a lot of um, confusion, perhaps, and uh, um, members of the public asserting that, that the local authority are electing to interpret it in certain ways. But I, and certainly my, in the statement we've put together, we're suggesting that um, perhaps a way around that is to, to take that, you know, that um, sentence out and basically just to have um, paragraph 1, B and C insofar as the, this act applies in relation to a hedge rises to a height of more than two metres above ground level and forms a barrier to light. I think a lot of the, the issues that have come about, we've had many people uh, approaching us in advance of perhaps putting an application and saying, well, will this be a hedge or not? And, you know, quite often in their, you know, even on the telephone, they're saying, you know, we ask them, well, what is it? Well, it's, 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 you know, it's maybe three trees in, their, in a neighbour's back garden. And, of course, the way that the, the Act is, has been narrated, um, you know, they're thinking, well, this... this perhaps would make a valid application. And uh, I think that's where, you know, it's, as I have said, it's not a high trees act, it's a high hedges act. Fundamentally, it must be a hedge first. And obviously, defining that is difficult. Um, my background before I came into planning was horticulture. And, you know, it's quite clear if someone says, you know, design me a hedge, you know, it's quite, uh, there's a process of going through the species that you use, the planting arrangement, the density. And I suppose to me it is, it's re relatively clear what a hedge is and what a hedge isn't. But um, I think the way that the Act has been narrated, I think it does give rise to some confusion. Mr. do you wish to come back in? Yes, yeah, that's uh, very helpful. And um, I mean, we have been sent a copy of a letter from Aberdeen City Council to um, one of uh, one of the applicants on the scheme in in, uh, in Aberdeen. Um, make it very clear that, in your view, you cannot consider any application that doesn't actually, in the first instance, um, relate to a hedge. It's fair to say, I think, that other local authorities haven't been quite so clear and robust in that test and have been prepared to admit for consideration um, vegetation that meets the tests of A, B and C. Um, but actually isn't a hedge, and that only becomes clear at a, at a later stage. Um, you, uh, Aberdeen, you provide, um, as you say, some tests that you apply as to what hedge is. These are not, however, statutory tests, so given that this all resolve, revol resolves around legal meanings, would it be helpful in your view, and as a matter of principle, to introduce a new section to make it clear that this Act only applies to hedges, and a hedge is X, Y, and Z, before then going on to say um, that nothing other than a hedge can be considered a high hedge, it then goes on to consider what a high hedge is. Would that Mr. help to resolve some of the difficulties? Mr Dyke, could I ask you to respond to that, please? Absolutely. I think that's probably exactly what we need. Um, the, I think going back to my colleague's comment a minute ago, um, the the fact that a high hedge has to be a hedge initially is often overlooked by people who are looking to put an application in. What do they jump to initially is the three tests. 
And of course, you know, nobody is sat here saying that a row of trees cannot have the same effect and can certainly meet those three tests. But a row of trees is not a hedge. So I think in the Act itself, as well as the guidance, making it abundantly clear um, that that is the first test, and then possibly within the guidance, some further definition, I think that would be incredibly useful. Okay. Thanks very much. Before I call in Mr Gibson, can I just clarify something myself with Mr Kettles, please, given your horticultural background? We, we've just heard Mr Wright say a row of trees is not a hedge, but originally when the Act was being considered, it was precisely rows of trees, i.e. rows of Leylandi trees, which had been planted as hedges that were causing problems because they were so quick growing and so dense and cutting out light and enjoyment and from people's gardens. So when is a row of trees a hedge? OK. Um, <clears throat> I would say it's down to the, the pattern arrangement of the planting. Um, so... I mean, I've, I've dealt with situations, typical situations, where Lelandii are planted maybe at uh, 600 or 700 millimetre centres in a row along a boundary, and there's no dispute that is a hedge. It forms a solid boundary uh, barrier, you know. Um, however, I've also dealt with Lawson Cypress Lelandii in a garden that have been planted, you know, uh, just to form part of a garden with planting underneath it, and it's forming a barrier to light, but I would say it's not a hedge uh, because there, are, there were certainly clear gaps. And the, it, it, the, the pattern of planting, the arrangement, did not resemble a hedge in any way. The fact that crowns coalesce doesn't mean to... Doesn't, you know, tree planting doesn't morph into a hedge just because the crowns coalesce. I think you have to look at where the stems are and the relationship between them, you know, the pattern. But would you agree that if someone... Uh, planted Leylandi as a hedge and confirmed that, then the person, for instance, that moved into their house after them or, or into the house next door and got that, it was evidence that we heard where they then got um, confirmation from the, the owners of the other house that it had been planted as a hedge, even though it was a row of trees because it's Leylandi and it was indeed high, that could constitute a hedge, even yes. though it's a row of trees. Yes. Yes, but again, I would say each case is looked at on its own merits. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, okay. Mr Gibson. Thanks. So I have to say that the evidence we've received this morning would certainly disappoint all the witnesses we had at a round table discussion, because from what I have heard this morning, it appears all our witnesses want to actually neuter this uh, already fairly toothless legislation uh, further. Uh, my constituents not, who, who have raised concerns about this, not only at bulk having to pay the outrageously high fee, which is not returned to them by the person if it's found against them, but they also have the situation whereby there's all the semantics about what is and what is not a hedge. Quite clearly, the meaning of the legislation, the spirit of the legislation, meant it clear that if someone's quality of life is being ruined by having a lalandi or whatever it happens, or some shrub or even trees, blocking out the light and making the life a misery, you know, um, then it should be dealt with. If, I, if I've got an 80-year-old constituent who buys a house in Largs with a life savings, if we had a husband suffering from dementia, and suddenly, a couple of years later, there's huge trees, uh, you know, sprouting up, blocking the light, why should that person not get restitution? Now, there's, there's some talk about semantic, about what constitutes a hedge or not, but the legislation, the spirit of the legislation is quite clear. Uh, on that, and surely the legislation should not be made more toothless by making it just a hedge, as people would understand a hedge, but to include the things that you want to exclude. I mean, why would you? What, what are we meant to do then? What are people meant to do about high trees? Somebody just meant to be able to plant trees wherever they like and ruin someone else's. You know, I mean, we had people who actually came to this committee who had trees completely surrounding their entire property on all four sides, and were told, "Tough, it's not a hedge. Go away." I mean, you know, it, it, say to people who are not affected by this, it can seem, well, so what? But to people who are directly affected, it's a real quality of life issue. And these people are often very elderly and they get deeply upset. I mean, Mr Wright, you talked about people who've corresponded with you umpteen times. That is because they feel that they have been let down by this legislation, that it's not... I know you're kind of wincing, but that, what I can honestly say that cross-party, the, 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 the intention of the MSPs involved in this was not to have a very narrow piece of legislation, but a legislation which could be interpreted in a common sense point of view. And I'll just say one other point before the panel come in. For example, we've had evidence of people deliberately trying to um, 
to get round the legislation by chopping uh, every second tree, knowing full or Leylandi, whatever you like to call it, hedge, knowing that it'll sprout sideways, having the same adverse impact on the person who's raised a complaint, and councils have just shrugged their shoulders and went, sorry, it's not a row of two trees. Well, it, maybe it's not a row of two trees above two metres, but certainly it's below two metres. Surely that the council should be taking a more flexible more human approach to this and looking at what, what is that, the impact on people's lives are and saying, well, do you know something? Uh, as far as we're concerned, you know, this has been deliberately planted uh, with a view to obscuring someone's life. Whether it's known a straight line or it's slightly curved or it's no specific hedge shouldn't really be the issue. Surely it should be the impact on the, the lives of the people who are blighted by this, Mr well, Wright. I will need to bring in all of the panel because Mr. Mr Gibson has asked if the intention is to neuter the legislation, but I'll start with Mr Wright. Um, I think probably the first point I would come back with is that um, there are a number of cases in Aberdeen where I would love to use this legislation. Um, there is one particularly heartbreaking case I've been dealing with for probably two years now, and I very much see the stress of this citizen, the situation he's in with young children and his first home and the impact that he has. However, in his instance, the trees do not constitute a hedge. We, as a local authority, are asked to implement this piece of legislation. Um, if I'm asked to justify my decision, I cannot stand up in a group of in front of a group of people and say, "Well, do you know what the legislation says this?" But I thought I'd be a little bit flexible about it. Flexibility when it comes to whether it's a hedge or whether it is trees planted not as a hedge, is not within the legislation. We don't have the legal opportunity to do that. Could I just, sure. one other point. I think it's very easy, and as I say, you know, we've had a number of very emotive cases where we would like to do this. However, we've had other cases where we, as a local authority, have to quite literally at times sit on the fence between properties. On one hand, we have somebody who is looking to remove um, trees from somebody else's land. We have to look at the impact, and indeed the legislation requires us to look at the, the impact fairly on the owners of those trees as well. Just to turn sort of the scenario around slightly, we have one particular case in Aberdeen, again, that's been going on for quite some time, whereby we have a house on D side, which has probably been in place for about 200 years. Uh, we have very, very many, many mature trees within that garden, and certainly the back of the garden. Now, that garden used to back onto fields. About four years ago, there was a brand new property built within what was quite honestly a reasonable distance away from mature trees. But this house was put on the open market. It wasn't The land wasn't bought and built by the owner. It was sold separately. That person moved in two years ago and decided to seek an application to have those trees removed. Now, personally, I would say that that's incredibly unfair on the owner of those trees. They are trees. They're not a hedge. But we have somebody who chose to buy a property and move into a situation. Now, I know there are only two scenarios, but it's really just to highlight, you know, there are other parties involved and other owners. I think the common sense approach, sorry, the common sense approach would do that. I don't think anybody see it. I've had a similar case and I looked at it and I said, come on. You know, that, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about people who are planting stuff and deliberately trying to avoid legislation. I mean, the issue I raised, for example, about people chopping every second one down, surely the council should say, I'm sorry, you're clearly trying to avoid the, you know, the impact of this legislation. Um, and I mean, Mr Kettles, you, you, you want to weaken the legislation, frankly, so it's just a hedge. Well, I mean, that's not what, the, what was intended. I can assure you that when we debate and discuss this some years ago, you know, people did want to include things beyond what is pu the public might recognise uh, walking along a street as a hedge. I'll bring Mr Kettles in first since uh, <coughs> you were named okay. and then I'll come back to Mr Wright if he wants to say anything further. Um, what I would say is that as a planning enforcement officer we operate, um, you know, personally as my, um, acting under the Town and County Planning Act, we have to operate within the terms of the Town and County Planning Act and, you know, 
pers- you know, whilst we look at situations and enforcement action is discretionary, um, so there's a degree of perhaps subjectivity, nevertheless, um, we have to remain within the terms of the Act. And in this case, I think we are operating within the terms of the Act. I think Perth and Cross Council have, in every application, operated within the terms of the Act, because fundamentally it must be a hedge. Now, I know that this, this you know, we could debate um, this, you know, for, for a long, you know, period of time, but at the end of the day, we are, I'm looking at it, my colleagues are looking at applications, and we, we consider that we're operating within the Act and within the spirit of the Act. Because it's not a High Trees Act. If you want to bring in legislation that is a High Trees Act, then, then introduce it. Well, that's, I'm just wondering why you, you don't want to extend it to some trees, given the fact you, you, you seem to want to dilute it. And again, no one's made, responded to the thing about what happens when somebody cuts every second, every second day of the land die down in order to kind of get around the legislation. I think perhaps Mr Wright wanted to um, respond to that, but I brought Mr Kettles in first, so yeah. Mr Wright. I'd be happy to. Again, um, <laughs> this is somebody getting around the legislation. Um, we haven't had this situation, thankfully, in Aberdeen. Um, I think had there have been, there is, I think if we had received an application and then those works had been undertaken, um, we would have to seek legal advice on whether we could still um, go forward with the application. Because ultimately it is the legislation that is, um, pointing out what a high hedge is. Now, if somebody removes every second tree, as unfair as that is, um, straight away, by the definition that we currently have, it is no longer a hedge. It is a row of trees. If they remove every second tree, those canopies will not coalesce. And therefore, it's not a hedge. If it's not a hedge, we can't currently use the legislation that we've got. One thing that I would say, and I think... I think part of it, and it may help our discussions going forward, is that when we're talking of rows of trees, um, and I think as we've all alluded to so far, one of the things that we take into consideration is the the spacing between those trees. So, and I think, um, Ms. Smith, you brought up a, a perfectly good question where you queried, you know, Leylandii trees. If it's a row of Leylandii trees, is it a hedge? Um, it can be a hedge. Equally, they can be individual trees. That would be like saying a beech hedge is a row of maintained beech trees. Um, so I think, you know, we were saying about rows of trees, but I was just madly flicking through the guidance for a particular sentence. Um, and this sentence states, for example, well-spaced tree lines are not gen generally considered as a hedge, even if the trees join to form a canopy. And I think going back to, um, sorry, I think it was Mr. Whiteman's question to me, would guidance on the types of subjects that I've raised as the sort of um, tests that we utilize be useful? Absolutely yes, because then we would all be working to something that's defined. Could I just make one... Briefly, if you don't mind, because I want to bring Mr Hamilton in. Um, it was just on a point, I guess, that was partly touched on, but also I'd read the um, sort of dialect from the previous um, sort of um, public consultation. One thing I wanted to flag up um, was that the, there's this imagination that councils are avoiding using this piece of legislation probably takes me between maybe 10 and 15 hours to deal with a high hedge legislation application from start to finish over a period of time, but maybe 10, 15 hours. Um, a number of the cases that we have dealt with, um, one in particular, I have racked up over 60 hours um, dealing with councillor representations, MSP representations, going through our complaints procedures and indeed looking to answer to senior staff within my organisation. Um, personally speaking, I would much prefer to be able to use the legislation. The work involved in telling somebody that we can't use the legislation is extensive. Sorry, thank, thank you. you. Mr Hamilton, do you wish to neuter the legislation? Um, Mr. No, um, I don't. I, and, I, and I think I would uh, speak for all my colleagues that apply it, that that isn't the intention of what we would wish to do or indeed how it's applied. I, I think if um, 
Parliament wishes to expand and extend its remit, then that is within their gift as part of how they consider the legislation further. I think it's important in terms of, and I think Mr Gibson's passion highlights how emotive the subject can be. And part of the issue is that passion that we face as those that actually Im Im implement the legislation is on both sides. That is on perhaps what you might say is the aggrieved party who has to alter their hedge and the party who is potentially affected by it. Um, so in applying legislation, the legislation itself firstly has to be robust enough to deal with that process because you're not only addressing the, the harm that's potentially arising from, from the hedge, but also justifying why you have the right to affect someone else's property and what they wish to do with it. And that principle is part of the basis of where planning legislation sits. And obviously, as I've, I've said in, in my submission, the high hedge um, legislation isn't implemented by planning services across the board in Scotland. There's some uh, other uh, services deliver it. But the other thing I wanted to pick up on as well, if I may, was the issue about the planting of a hedge, and, and Kevin's picked up on that too, is that you would have to be careful about that and the breadth of what the legislation sought to cover. Because if you started to apply that to trees that already exist in established areas, and there are many uh, residential areas in Scotland where there are mature trees, tr houses planted within existing woodland areas or next to those, that could have a significant consequence for the tree population. Um, okay, there are some that are protected by tree preservation orders, but you would need to be very careful in seeking to broaden that, and no doubt some trees do have an impact on people, but if the principle of this legislation arose from the concerns about Lelandii and the, the, the planting of hedges, that would need to be a very careful consideration if the legislation was being sought to be more um, prescriptive or precise to deal with planting hedges and at what point that then becomes a problem. Yeah, thanks. A final point from Kenneth Gibson and then I'll move on to Alexander. It, it was just, just the point I, I did in my, in my you know, um, overlong um, first question, which was basically, it was, might have been uh, not picked up, was do you feel that if... Um, an application is successful, the cost of that application should be borne by the person for whom it's uh, found against. In other words, if the applicant is dismissed, then he, he or she should pay it. Uh, but if it's successful, then the person who has actually um, breached the, the law, so to speak, should, ha should pay it. Because at the moment, people who make application feel uh, that why should they have to pay up to £500, you know, for example, and uh, it not be restored to them if indeed they're found to be in the right. Mr Kettles, you're nodding. <laughs> yeah, I agree with you wholeheartedly that mm -hmm. if someone, if you know, we, local authority, serve a high hedge notice on a hedge owner, then I, th I, th I do think that um, because they had ha had opportunity to address the issue and hadn't, then we should seek to get perhaps half the fee back or some arrangement uh, so that the applicant is, is you know, refunded either in part or in total. So I do agree with you. Thank you. Mr Wright, do you have an opinion? Um, I would tend to agree. However, I think it's worthwhile noting where the fee actually came from in the first place, in as much as, in normal circumstances, this would not have been a service that the council would offer. Um, so I believe, as the introduction of the legislation, this was a way that the council could recoup for their time used. Um, I think all I would say is if I don't disagree with the point, and I think it would only be fair, given that somebody has had good opportunity in the first place to do it, um, what I would be keen to see is a good mechanism to ensure that um, the local authority didn't end out of pocket at the end of the day in dealing with these. Mr Hamilton. 
Yes, I mean, I think that's a good point. And obviously, part of when the, the legislation was drafted, uh, it, it, it was done so on the basis of it being the local authority as a last resort. And the emphasis was very much on the basis of that, the issue being resolved where it could be by mutual agreement and collaboration between both parties, whether that's through formal solicitors or just um, neighbourly discussions, which obviously would be the most beneficial uh, way to, to do so. That, that, that was kind of implicit in the legislation. I think one of the other things to bear in mind that while it may perhaps seem unjust for the person who is um, affected by the hedge to pay the fee, if you then share that on to the person who also has to undertake, if you like, the mitigation work, there wouldn't necessarily be an impetus on them to pay that if they're the ones having to undertake the work. So again, I suppose that comes back to the point that, that Kevin's made about making sure that the recouping of the cost from the party who has to undo the work uh, is clear. Stuart, um, Andy Whiteman wants a very short intervention on this. Yes, just a brief supplementary to that. Um, would it be your view as well that if, as the legislation currently stands, an application was rejected because it's not a hedge, should have to pay the full fee? Because at the moment, an application made and rejected in those circumstances is a very modest piece of administration, and yet they're paying the full fee. Um, I think if you were applying the same principle as a planning application, which was subsequently refused, then you would do. I mean, ine inevitably, in assessing that, there is work involved, and the authorities... Um, really in terms of where the legislation is coming from and the fee structure that's applied to it are, I would say, in, entitled to um, place a reasonable fee on the cost of that work. Thanks very much. Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Convener. The guidance talks about dealing with it in a timely manner, and, a, and that has caused some difficulty uh, because many of the witnesses <coughs> felt that that was a bit too subjective. Uh, uh, and it did give the opportunity uh, for some of the landowners to, to maybe alter uh, between the application and the action taking place. Uh, so I'd like your views on what you think about this timely manner uh, that's put in the act uh, 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 that has caused this situation to arise. Mr Wright, do you want to respond first? Um, I would like to think, certainly I can't think of any issues that we've had in Aberdeen with sort of being timely and um, going through the process. What I would say is, is that the, the overall process is a particularly long process. Um, you'll probably be familiar with part of the Act is that it is very much a open process in as much as whenever we receive information, we are required to copy that, redact it if there are certain things in it that require to be redacted, and then pass that information on. Um, now, within that, there are stipulated timeframes that we have to give people as well. So, in reality, I would say that that timely manner is probably approaching easily three months. Um, now, I could well imagine that that's not deemed as very acceptable, but you know, even with best efforts, um, I think you'd be struggling to get it much below that. Mr Hamilton, do you have a view? Um, I suppose, I mean, essentially, the undertaking of the works, it, it effectively, it creates an enforcement process, and, and that can be very difficult to prescribe a precise <coughs> period to deliver that. I mean, and particularly with, with the the alteration to hedges and vegetation. There are also wildlife considerations that need to be built into that. And there, there is a kind of a, if you like, potentially a closed period during the breeding season where it's not, it may not be acceptable to cut or alter the hedge if there's nesting birds, for example. Um, so part of that has to get built into that process. And um, there's also issues about, depending on the scale of the works involved, how long that might take to factor in as well. So it, it is a very difficult area to be um, precise. And I think to some degree, well, n none of us that implement the legislation would prolong it unnecessarily. I think there needs to be a degree of flexibility built into that to cover the 
uh, vagaries and slightly unknown issues that can arise. Thank you, Mr Kettles. Yeah, um, I would say in Perth and Ross, of those applications that we have um, received, determined, uh, that have not been subject to an appeal, we will have made a decision uh, as in issuing a notice within probably eight weeks of receipt of the application. But obviously, you know, as has already been mentioned, the notice in terms of compliance period will have to take account of wildlife. So I've just issued one in the last 10 days and the compliance period is September to basically take it right out of the, the nesting season. So um, the other thing is that we go on the premise like we do with an enforcement notice that if, if it's subject to an appeal, then a reporter always looks for the local authority to act reasonably. So that is a kind of test that I would always sit down and say, well, is it reasonable for me to ask this particular individual to cut a hedge? It could be, you know, some of them we've had are 75 metres long, um, you know, within three weeks. Well, I would say it's unreasonable, you know. So, f you know, so we have to do that test anyway. Um, but in terms of process, yeah, we, we, we tend to, I was looking online, uh, you know, looking at our, our cases, and I would have said we, we seem to average around the same time frame as a planning application, six to eight weeks, in terms of actually issuing a decision. So. Thank you. Mr Short, do you wish to come back with anything? Thank you. Any other colleagues wish to? Jenny Godith. Yeah, thank you, Convener. Um, just to ask the panel, um, specifically, which department is it within your authority which carries out site visits uh, to assess whether or not a hedge is a hedge? or not, indeed, if that makes sense. Because when we were taking evidence from a previous session, there was a lack of continuity across the country in terms of who does that. Is it somebody from the planning department? Is it someone with a history of dealing with hedges? So just to kind of get an overview of, of who it is who makes that final decision, uh, if you could all just... Start with Mr Kettles, who seems to do both. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm, I'm in the planning service. Background is horticulture and arboriculture. So I, I was a kind of... Um, the, the, <laughs> I suppose the person that was identified as... Richard Hamilton? Um, it's the high hedges applications are dealt with by uh, planning officers in Fife Council. Um, we also have an in-house arboriculturalist that we can call on for advice as well. Thank you. And Mr Wright? Um, I work with the environment planner team. I'm the sole officer within Aberdeen dealing with high hedges. Thank you. Do any good with? Can I just go back to Mr Hamilton? Um, Fife Council use planning officers, you said, and then what was it they use? We have an arboricultural specialist, so she uh -huh. deals with tree preservation orders and, and is qualified and previously uh, worked in horticulture as well. Right. So we, ha we have her assistance for not so much defining whether it's a hedge or not. That's very much part of the assessment through the, the planning process and applying the, the legislation, but more so in terms of what the mitigation strategy might be, timescales types of trees, what the different impacts of those would be. In terms of carrying out site visits, would she be called out as a matter of course or only in unusual um, circumstances? Not as a matter of course. Mm -hmm. um, that would be for um, the planning officer that's dealing with the case would do that. But as I say, she, she's on hand and yeah. it's a flexible approach. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Any other colleagues wish to come in, Mr Simpson? Um, do any of you have any examples of um, pe people who've had a a high hedge <coughs> notice um, issued, simply refusing to go along with it. Mr. Wright, are you? Uh, no, are we, we have been thankfully successful so far. Um, no, we have had, um, I think, an appeal where um, the party who uh, had complained felt that the mitigation wasn't significant enough and they appealed and that was required to do additional work. Um, the pattern by and large so far seems to be once the parties are involved in the process more often than not some mitigation occurs either before it, the case is resolved or it a, at the outcome, something is done wh which actually addresses the the issue in a number of cases. Um, we have had compliance with every notice that we have issued. There was one particular one where the 
um, hedge owner didn't uh, comply on the date that we required him to, and I was uh, taking steps to take direct action. And when I contacted a particular contractor, he said he was scheduled to go and cut it. So um, he had made contact with it uh, with a contractor, and the, the work was carried out within two weeks after the date. So we've had full compliance. Mr. Simpson, um, I just want to go back to uh, pre previous questioning. Um, so it's quite. It seems to be clear to me that the act is unclear. Shall we say? Um, that's quite. Ob that's quite obvious from what you, you've all said uh, and what previous witnesses have said. And we need some clarity uh, around the definition of a hedge. But do you think that? And maybe this is just a personal opinion. I'm, as I'm asking for. Should it be extended so that it definitely covers trees and we don't get bogged down with this word hedge? Mr Kettles. Um, I live in big tree country in Perth and Kinross and I would be, I think um, uh, Perth and Kinross is a tourist destination for one of the things, the tree cover in Perth and Kinross. And I'm not saying that, you know, if we opened it up to trees that would devastate Perth and Ross of trees, but I think it, it's opening a door um, to, you know, something, you know, where, where we're looking to preserve trees, protect trees. I think if we broadened the, the act to include trees per se, then it would give rise to a significant loss of urban trees. Mr Hamilton? Uh, I think my answer would have to be no. I think, as I said before, I think it would open up uh, a, a significant area of unforeseen consequences in terms of the impact it would have on the tree cover in Scotland. Right. It uh, looks like you're getting a resounding no. Um, I would not like to see the legislation extended. I think it would have a massive impact at a time where local authorities are beginning to recognise the benefit, particularly of urban trees uh, and the benefits that they bring within the city. Um, we're struggling enough with tree cover um, without giving a piece of legislation um, that means people can insist owners of trees have to cut them down. Well, I'm going to come back to the panel before I conclude and ask each of you perhaps to say what, what you would see specifically as being something that could improve the Act to help you carry out your job and to help people get satisfaction. But before I do, uh, Andy Whiteman's indicating. Yes, no, I was just wondering, a, a general question, of course, as you're aware, the um, this committee is more likely to hear from people who are dissatisfied with the legislation than those who are satisfied with it. And Mr Hamilton, you mentioned at the beginning as well that the legislation was very much designed as a sort of last resort where, you know, reasonable endeavours hadn't hadn't succeeded. I mean, in general terms, do you think the legislation is working well? Um, it would it would seem to be. I mean, all we all I can go on, I suppose, is the general number of applications that we've received probably hasn't um, been as significant, perhaps, as we would have expected. Whether that's to do with the breadth of what it covers, I don't know. Um, all, all I can say is that those cases that have been resolved, um, inevitably the people that have benefited from that will at least feel that, that, that legislation has achieved its purpose. Um, We've discussed, I think, a, num a number of the difficulties with this type of legislation, which is different to planning permission for a fixed structure, like a wall or a building. And it is the nature of the fact you're dealing with something that is alive, grows, and to degree is perhaps, uh, can be sort of semi-permanent, it might be deciduous trees, and the impact is maybe less less when there's no tree cup in, in leaf. So there's a number of, of kind of difficulties that are embedded into, into applying this. But um, I think on the whole, broadly, within the scope of what the legislation covers at the moment, it, it, has, it, has, it achieves what it needs to achieve. Thank you. Mr Wright, at the beginning, you mentioned that you thought that the threat of the legislation might have been helpful. 
Is Indeed. that something that you would expand on, and given the question from Mr. Whiteman? Yes, we've had, um, especially in the first sort of six months of the legislation coming out, and less so, but sort of continuously, um, we regularly get um, emails, telephone calls for people looking for information about what can be done and a bit more further information on the high hedges legislation. You'll be aware that part of the legislation requires people to try and resolve it. If there, and often there has already been verbal conversations, um, we encourage that they put a letter out to their neighbour and specifically highlight the legislation and where they can find it. Um, it is very rare that we hear back from these people. What has been rather nice over the years is that we have been contacted probably by a good half dozen or so people to say that, you know, we don't need to come back to you because, you know, just the the threat, if we want to use that word, the legislation has been useful. Mr Hamilton? Yeah, it was just kind of a further observation on that, I suppose, and it's maybe something for the committee to ponder. If, if the, pur the purpose of the legislation, obviously, is to set out a premise that the neighbours try and resolve this themselves, and I suppose one of the issues is in those circumstances, we wouldn't necessarily know whether the legislation's been acceptable because it will have been dealt with by the neighbours. Do you wish to add anything to this? Yeah, I'm aware that we have had um, people contact us um, in advance of putting an application in and... Uh, you know, we're explaining to them the situation and I think they've gone and contacted the hedge owner, their neighbour, and made them aware of the act and the matter has been resolved. I am aware of that. I am also wish to, to just mention that even the sites where um, we have not issued a high hedge notice, um, but what I, I tend to do is put a very short... Uh, paragraph in a report mentioning perhaps some work that you know or some things that have been noticeable for example perhaps dead branches or dead trees within a given area um, perhaps slightly straying out with the, the high the, the, the hedge issue in a sense but nevertheless pointing out that there, there, there's um, scope for doing work that has then gone on to be undertaken by the owner on two occasions we had one where they, they actually they cleared fell the woodland. Not that I asked for that, but uh, without a notice being issued, uh, that was cleared. And I had another situation where the, the individual went in and thinned out trees, reduced their crowns, etc., etc. And that was not subject to a notice being issued. But um, comment had been made in relation to the management of their trees, and it was responded to positively. Thanks very much. A final point from Mr Gibson, please. Yes, I mean, Mr Wright at the start said that he thought the legislation wasn't, I quote, incredibly beneficial and created a lot of hope. As Mr Hamilton said, obviously it heightened expectations. And I think one of the things that, that, that <coughs> the base of the legislation was was that people would resolve these issues privately. I mean, the, the anecdotal information we received from the English legislation was that more than 90% were resolved because of the existence of the Act was kind of hanging over them, like the sword of Damocles, and people thought, well, we better just sort this out. And obviously, unfortunately, you end up with the intractable cases, obviously, that come to you. But just just one, one other point on that is basically um, the only local authority in Scotland that... Uh, kind of reduces fees according to someone's income is South Ayrshire. And I'm just wondering if the variance in fees from £172 to £500 does put people off applying for a high hedge notice because uh, it's a lot of money to cough up if you're not necessarily going to be successful at the end of the day. And that's why earlier on I was talking about whether there should be um, full cost recovery if um, an applicant is successful. So I'm just wondering if you have any evidence, anecdotal or otherwise, that the cost of the application itself um, is, a, is, a, is stopping people from applying. And we are aware, obviously, that there has to be, uh, the, the councils shouldn't be out of pocket, and that's why they have these fees, but it's just whether or not that's having an impact. Well, could I ask you all to specifically answer that question, but also to make any final remarks that you would wish to make, uh, anything that you think specifically should be done to make the legislation better, to make your job easier in implementing it, because we're now coming to the end of this session, and I'll start the other way around with Mr Kettles. OK. Um, <clears throat> I do think that uh, the guidance could be perhaps uh, 
made clearer in so far as you know, understanding of what the definition of a hedge is. I do think that that's one change that could be brought in, uh, amending the guidance. Um, I don't know whether or not even some pictorial guidance might have been helpful for members of the public. We have a, our own guidance sheet that we issue that's on, on our website. Um, so I, I certainly informing the um, members of the public what is likely to be a hedge and what isn't uh, might be helpful. In, in, even in pictorial form. And so far as the um, high hedge uh, application fees, we've set ours at £270 in Perth and Ross, and I so say we've received 21 to date. Um, I think 270 is actually quite a reasonable fee uh, by comparison with others. Um, I've only had one individual who was a senior citizen who did say, I can't afford £270. And that's out of all the inquiries I've received, that was one response. So I do think it might be useful if we had a fee set, just like the planning fees are set, why not set a high hedge notice application fee across Scotland? Thank you. Mr Hamilton. Um, I suppose, uh, firstly, in terms of, of looking at what might improve the legislation, I suppose my observation, going back to the start of the session about the subjectivity and how that might be dealt with maybe more effectively to give a bit more confidence in the legislation from from those parties that are told the local authority isn't accepting it as a hedge is whether there is some mechanism of a, a, an appeal process perhaps within that again it does add to the kind of the maybe longevity of the process but again if we get into a situation as, as colleagues here have explained of repeated correspondence about trying to justify that, that might be a way to expedite that part of the process and, and, and as well build up, build up some sort of case law. Um, also, I, I hope and I've, I've no doubt the committee in its deliberations will look at some of the, the decisions that the, the reporters have uh, um, issued in their consideration of, of, high, of high hedge cases where they've um, determined those and hopefully that will bring together and, and the conclusions there as well. In terms of the issue of the fees, um, I, I actually sit as well on, on heads, heads of Planning Scotland in the Development Management Subcommittee, and when this was discussed there, round the table of all, um, well, it was 32 um, of the local government planning authorities anyway, as well as the, the, the national parks, um, the number of cases we had in Fife at 23 was... I think the largest number that had been received, our fee is £385 at the moment. Um, a number of other authorities were higher, a number were lower, but there didn't seem to be any pattern um, related to the number of cases submitted relative to what fees were set. Thanks. And Mr Wright? Um, looking at fees first, uh, when the legislation first came in, we were required to go to our members to seek delegated powers to make decisions on um, applications that we received. As part of that, we were requested to monitor uh, for a period of 12 months and then go back to committee. And the monitoring was in relation to whether the fee was putting off potential applicants. In that 12 month period, we had only two people who inquired about the high edges legislation who announced that they could and wouldn't be able to afford that fee. In that situation, what we done, we encouraged them that clearly the first steps are, that have to be undertaken by somebody who is looking to apply doesn't really cost much in as much as you know putting a letter discussing it with the neighbours even going through mediation we're quite lucky in Aberdeen we have free mediation service um what we don't know and this is part of you know the gathering of evidence in this is whether they got to a certain stage and resolved the issue all got to a certain stage and didn't come back to us to say, you know, we've tried every avenue and we're having to stop because we can't afford it. Um, but as I say, if at the most we had two in a 12 month period. Um, moving to um, what I would like to see um, to make sort of life easier and sort of, I guess, um, help sort of the, 
citizens with um, the High Hedges Act. Um, I think whilst when you actually look at the legislation, if you are used to looking at legislation, it is quite clear that a hedge, well, you have to have a hedge before you can class it as a high hedge. This is very, very commonly overlooked by those who maybe aren't used to looking at legislation. And I think whilst legislation isn't necessarily meant to be the easiest thing in the world, this is aimed at householders in general. I think a very clear statement at the start of the legislation stating that if that is the decision of the committee, um, that you have to have what is considered to be a hedge before you can apply the tests of a high hedge. Um, from a guidance perspective, I would encourage a narrative of or a suite of tests that can be applied across Scotland fairly, um, so we have a, a real standpoint and definition of what a hedge is. Thank you very much, which I think is back to where we started. And thank you all for coming along um, to the committee this morning. And on behalf of the committee, thank you. And that then moves us into private session and a recess committee for a few moments.